Welcome to the Overcoming series and Helping Focus and this is Alphabet B and I'll be talking today about breast cancer which is the first part of the series. Now last series with Alphabet A we had Alzheimer's, arthritis, asthma, allergies and addictions and I received lots and lots and lots of emails about those conditions and I'm sure I probably will be doing the same about the B series. Now the B series is a little bit bleak because we're dealing with um, two or three main types of cancers, bowel cancer, breast cancer and bladder cancer. But we should also be dealing with bed bedwetting which is uh, a common problem in children and back pain as well as bipolar disorders and those are the conditions I will be dealing with in the B series. So I'm going to start today with part one of breast cancer. Now we've got an image of the breast, which is a tissue which is mainly made up of fatty tissue with connective tissue surrounding it, holding the structure together and it's basically on a wall of chest wall muscle which is called the pectoral wall muscle or pectoralis wall muscle. We've got a little bit of the breast tissue heading up into the axilla, into the armpit and that's called the axillary tail and you can see a diagram just a little bit of the tissue heading up into the axilla. Now the breast is made up of lobules and these lobules are the glandular tissue which produce the milk for the baby and the lobules lead into ducts and these ducts are the channels by which the breast milk flows from the lobules where they're made to the end of the, uh, of the ducts which is the nipple from where the baby sucks. And of course, the breast tissue is also surrounded by blood vessels, lymph vessels and nerves, which help to keep all the structures together. As I said, the nipple is the opening of the ducts through which the milk that's produced by the lobules is transferred into baby. And of course, there's a, just a recap of the breast again. And you can see the chest wall, which is the base, the pectoralis muscle, which is the chest wall muscle, number two. Number three is the lobules, the brown-like structures, grape-like structures. We've got the ducts, uh, number six, which are the little tubes that lead to the nipple. And of course, this, it is surrounded by areola and skin as well. Some facts about breast cancer. Breast cancer is the most common cancer in the UK. It makes up 30%. That's one in three of the cancers that are found in women are due to breast cancer. It's highest in the population of people who are in developing countries like the Western countries, of course, in Europe, um, America, etc. And of course, it's also high in people with a higher social economic class. The lowest incidence of breast cancer are found in South Europe, in Africa, and in Asian women. 80% of people of, of breast cancer is found in women over the age of 50. So it is, a, it is a condition that is common in women over the age of 50, that is women who are past their menopause. Very rarely is it found in women under 20. If it is, it's probably related to a genetic um, um, inheritance. And, but if a woman under 35 has breast cancer, I mean, has cancer, then it's likely to be a breast cancer. Only a few men have breast cancer. Only 1% of all cancers are due to, uh, from, from men, with only as many as 300 being diagnosed yearly. So it is obviously a female thing. And overall, in a woman's, uh, in a woman's lifetime, there is a one in nine chance of having breast cancer. Some more facts about breast cancer. A bit morbid, but we need to face the facts and deal with them so we know how to deal with the situation. Another fact is, of course, that death rates have fallen, which is good news. Although there's been an increase in the number of diagnoses being made, the actual death rate of cancers has dropped, which is, a, which is very, actually very, very good news. We're picking them up earlier, 
and so there are more chances of having better treatment sooner and therefore avoiding death. But unfortunately, cancer still causes at least 12,500 deaths per year, which is still a very, very high rate of cancer. Now, what I'm going to do now is to show you a clip that summarises breast cancer and the types of breast cancer. So we're going to watch a clip now and then I'm going to bring you back to continue on this particular topic. Breast cancer is the second most frequent form of cancer in Europe, with an estimated 245,000 new cases each year. In women, it's the most common type of cancer, but it is not just women who get it. One in every 150 patients who get it will be a man. Breast cancer is the second most common cause of cancer-related deaths in women. However, as a result of improved screening, extensive research and development of treatments, the outlook for patients has improved substantially in recent years. Each breast is made up of a glandular tissue, connective tissue and fat. The glandular tissue consists of lobules capable of producing milk after childbirth. A network of ducts carries the milk from the lobules to the nipple. Fat fills the spaces between the lobules and ducts and accounts for nearly 80% of the breast during the reproductive years. An area of breast tissue extends into the armpit or axilla called the axillary tail. A network of vessels drain fluid called lymph from the breast, mainly into lymph nodes in the armpit, but some lymph goes to lymph glands behind the breastbone and behind the collarbone. These lymph vessels belong to a network of channels and lymph nodes known as the lymphatic system, which filters and returns lymph to the bloodstream and helps protect the body against infection. Within our bodies, cells are constantly growing old, dying and being replaced by new cells. This renewal process is normally ordered and controlled. However, it can sometimes become uncontrolled, resulting in a mass, also known as a tumour or a neoplasm. Tumours may be benign or malignant. A benign tumour is not a cancer. It does not invade into other tissues or spread around the body. Malignant tumours are cancerous. They invade surrounding tissues and destroy them. Cells can also break off from the original tumour and travel through the lymphatic system and the bloodstream to other organs where they take hold and grow to produce secondary tumours. This spread of cancer is called metastasis. Some tumours are aggressive and spread early in their development, whereas others become metastatic only in the later or advanced stages of the disease. There are several different forms of breast cancer. They are named according to their appearance under the microscope and whether the cancer has spread. The two most common forms of breast cancer described by the pathologist are ductal carcinoma, which was originally thought to originate in the milk ducts, and lobular carcinoma, which was thought to originate in the lobules. In fact, it is now known that both ductal and lobular cancers develop in the lobule and the duct, which drains the lobule, which are known together as the terminal duct lobular unit. These two types of cancer have a different behavior, and so it is useful to separate them. If the cancer remains in its place of origin in the terminal duct or the lobule, it is described as in situ. Welcome back to Health in Focus. We're talking about breast cancer, part one. By the way, you can contact me on laura at revelationtv.com and I also have a Facebook page, which is Health in Focus Revelation TV, if you want to be my friend. I think I've got about 73 Facebook friends on Health in Focus page now, so looking for more friends. Back to breast cancer. 
the risk factors of breast cancer. Now, age is one of the most important risk factors. As I've mentioned before, it's commonly found in women over the age of 50 years, not so much under 50. 80% 80 of cancers in breast are in women who are over 50 years of age. Another risk factor is the use of HRT. Women who use HRT, hormone replacement therapy, for prolonged periods, particularly over the age of over, over five years of usage, are more likely at more at risk of developing breast cancer. There are lots of valid reasons why women would use HRT. They might have had a premature menopause, and they may have very severe um, menopausal symptoms, hot flushes, etc., etc. But generally, remember the menopause is a natural state that women, all women, enter into at some point. Therefore it's best not to use HRT if you can avoid it as much as possible. Another risk factor for HRT is obesity. Women who are over a, a certain body mass index, have a body mass index of 25, have a 30% higher risk of developing breast cancer than women who are in the normal weight range because actually the estrogen, it, it accumulates in the fat cells in, 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 the, in the female body who's obese. And 4,000 4, cases out of the 12,000 are due to women who are more, that are heavier than they should be. Alcohol is another important risk factor for breast cancer. And women who drink more than a unit of alcohol a week are more prone to develop breast cancer, more at risk of it. And so, just half a glass to a glass of wine, not more than two or three times a week is sufficient if you really must have your alcohol. Uh, women with a strong family history, for instance, people who've had relatives who've either had breast or ovarian cancer are more at risk of developing breast cancer. And another risk factor for breast cancer is hereditary. It's the BRCA1 gene which is found in a few people and is responsible for breast cancer. Now there is an OPERA, an online personal education and risk assessment tool that can be used to check if a person is at risk of having breast cancer and it's actually worth doing it. Go online, OPERA, O-P-E-R-A, just Google that and it helps to determine your risk. As I've said, genes, the BRCA gene, Women who have inherited this gene, the BRCA1 and 2, are much higher risk of developing breast cancer. There's also another gene called the TP53, which is also um, uh, a risk for breast cancer. Women who have had previous treatment for breast cancer are also at risk of developing the cancer. Again, more than women who have never had breast cancer. Another risk factor is women who have had lumps, breast lumps. Before. If they had lumps in their breasts, and especially if they were cancerous lumps, or certain types of non-cancerous lumps are also at risk of breast cancer. And these lumps are called either the um, lobular hypercarcinoma in situ or the uh, apical ductal hyperplastic types of, of growths. Women with denser breast tissue, again, remember the breast is made up of fatty tissue, so women with more dense fatty tissue are, again, more at risk of developing breast cancer. And so are women who have a prolonged um, bout of estrogen exposure. So women, for instance, who have had early periods, they started periods before the age of 12, and the periods have continued um, over the age of 55, the long exposure to estrogen also puts women at risk of breast cancer. Interestingly, women who are taller than average, although research has not yet found a reason why this is, but women who are taller than average have a slightly increased risk of developing breast cancer, uh, and we don't, we don't quite know why. Women who have been exposed to radiation when they were younger, they've had some sort of procedure when they were younger that's exposed them to high levels of radiation when in their childhood, scans, that sort of thing, are also slightly higher risk of developing breast cancer. Women who have not breastfed or have breastfed for not for very long periods of time 
are also at risk, more at risk of developing breast cancer. So if you can breastfeed ladies, it is certainly good to breastfeed. That's the take home message from this. If you can breastfeed, do breastfeed. You're watching Dr. Laura, it's Health in Focus, and I'm talking about risks of breast cancer. Another risk factor is the contraceptive pill. But the risk disappears after a woman has been on the pill, a, a woman has stopped taking the pill for about 10 years. That risk actually disappears. So, I mean, we know the contraceptive pill is a hormone, and of course, it has high levels of both estrogen and progesterone, which are higher than the normal levels that would be found in the female body who's not on the pill. Another interesting risk factor is night shift workers, particularly women who have worked in the night shift before their first pregnancy. I mean, there you go. That's another, uh, another um, factor that's been um, found, a link to breast cancer. That's women who work night shifts before their first pregnancy. Um, maybe due to uh, sleep patterns, maybe due to eating patterns, not quite sure, but there, is, there seems to be a link there. Now, there's some myths that we need to debunk regarding breast cancer, and one of them is that a person who has pain has cancer, or is more likely to have cancer, and, and, and similarly, a person who has no pain is not likely to have cancer. I mean, I'm afraid they are myths, they're not true, and that you can have pain with cancer, and, you, and cancer could also be painless. Living near electric, electric pylons have been associated with cancer, but unfortunately, or rather fortunately, I should say, for those who live near those large electric pylons, there's been no associated cause with breast cancer. Another myth is about breast implants, that people who have breast implants are more likely to have cancer. Again, that is a myth that needs to be debunked completely. Deodorants is another myth, whether aluminium or otherwise. Um, there was a myth going around and lots of emails circulating about this myth that um, using deodorants causes uh, breast cancer. It's not true, it's not true. Okay, we carry on. The breast screening process in the UK starts at the age of 50, although it has now started, the, the women are now being called in their late 40s and it goes on till the age of 70 in the UK. Now, the breast screening process is a very good one and I highly recommend it to any woman who is within the 50 to 70 age range. Recent studies in Europe have actually shown that for every thousand women aged between 50 to 70 who are tested for breast cancer, you would save seven to nine lives. So that's for every thousand people seven to nine lives would be saved. That's about 1% of lives would be saved. And there are four false positives. So in a thousand women, cancer would be diagnosed. Lives will be saved in about seven to nine of those. But for some unfortunate four women, they would have false positives, which would increase the, uh, the anxiety, and the stress until the positives have been shown to be false. And I know certainly that I've, you know, I've known of patients who've been, di who've been diagnosed with cancer and in the end they've turned out not to have cancer. And I sympathize with them because of the anxiety that it causes when they think they might have cancer. But at the same time, remember that twice the number of women who have um, false positives actually have true positives and their lives have been saved by the early detection of cancer. And the number of deaths, and another myth about breast cancer screening, apart from the false positives, is that the radiation causes uh, increased death rate due to induced cancer from the radiation. But the number of deaths from radiation-induced breast cancer is estimated to be a maximum of 50 women per one million women screened. So a maximum of 50 women per one million women screened would have radiation exposure as the cause of breast cancer. Now I know again, these are statistics, these are human beings we're dealing with. These are not just statistics, but these are actually human beings. But I just want to say to you that many, many lives are saved by the breast screening process. So I would advise you to please go and have the breast screening process 
when you're called up for it. You're watching Health in Focus with Dr. Laura and this is Breast Cancer Part 1. And now we're going to go to a simple break, which is Healthy Choices, brought to you by Health in Focus. Water, maim, el agua in Spanish. They all mean the same thing, whatever language you speak. But did you know that the body is made up of up to 70% of water? Did you know that? 70% of water. That's a lot of water, is it not? Now, we need water for so many things in the body. We need water to do all the processes that we have in our body. We need water for digestion, we need water for release of um, waste matter, we need water to regulate our body temperatures, we need water for carrying nutrients, we need water for waste products, we need water basically for just about everything in the body. We need water also to provide a moist environment for us. And so the list goes on and on and on. But how much water do we need and are you getting enough? Now I've got a little diagram on here that tells you exactly how much water we need each day. We've got eight glasses of water that are needed by us every single day. And the thing about drinking eight glasses of water is it doesn't have to be boring. You can spice it up. It's quite easy to make up your eight glasses without so much as a fuss. This is what you can do. Instead of just having ordinary water, guess what you can do? You can make some herbal tea. You can make it as a squash. You can drink a glass of skim milk, of course skim milk, or soy milk. That's one of the things you can do. Guess what else? You've got lots of succulent fruits. You've got things like melons, pineapples, grapes, strawberries. They all contain very large quantities of water. Iceberg lettuce, things like that. Cucumber, celery, broccoli. The list goes on and on and on. And of course, remember, with all the drinking you're doing, the greatest drink that you can have is the living water. Jesus said himself, anyone who's thirsty, come unto me and I will give you living water that would never, ever thirst again. So you've been watching Health in Focus, Healthy Choices, and I'd like you to continue to drink lots of water because it's good for you. And welcome back to Healthing Focus. I hope you enjoy that little healthy choice tip brought to you by Healthing Focus. I'm talking about breast cancer, and this is part one. I'd like to talk about diagnosis of breast cancer. The thing is, nine out of ten women are the ones who make their diagnosis of breast cancer. They know the symptoms they have and the signs, and then they go to the doctor to verify them. So what are the things that a woman looks out for when she may suspect she has breast cancer? These are the symptoms. The first one is a lump. A lump could be painless or it could be painful, but nevertheless, there is a lump that a woman may feel. And it might be that she's not felt this lump before. It might be that she has, but she doesn't know whether it changes with her menstrual cycle or not. So she needs to check it out. And that if you're a woman still having periods, what you should do is check your, check your breasts before your periods and then check them about a week or 10 days after your periods and see if there's a change in the lumps. So lumps could be painful, they could be painless. A lump in the armpit it, that's not particularly related to your, your menstrual cycle is a good reason to go and see your GP um, to be checked out, to get a second opinion. Another thing is looking for pitting or redness of the skin around the breast, a sort of an orange skin, orange peel look about it, dimpling of the skin. If there's a change, there's pitting or puckering or redness of the skin where there would normally not have been, again, it's a good idea to have your GP check that out. If you find, if a woman finds a rash around or on, or on the nipple area, whether it's flaky or crusty, again, it's a good idea to see the GP, to have it checked out again. Another thing to look out for is a lump in the armpits, you know, where it goes up into the axilla. Have that checked out, whether it's painful or painless. Uh, if you're married, get your partner to check it out for you. And again, if it's, it's obvious that there is a lump there, then please go and see your doctor. 
Another, another symptom is an area of thickness in the breast tissue, not a lump, but just a thickness in an area. Go and see your doctor. A nipple discharge, whether it's clear, whether it's milky, whether it's uh, blood stained, a good reason to go and see your, your GP. The nipple changes in the look of it. That's another reason to go and see your doctor. So if it becomes sunken, it becomes inverted, if it changes in any other way, basically women, what I'm trying to say to you is that you know your breasts or you should know your breasts. You should be the one who knows that there has been a change in your breasts. So whatever change you notice, please do not hesitate to go and see the GP. A change in the size, if it's on, for instance, especially if it's a unilateral change, where one breast seems to be particularly larger or smaller or shrunken or changed in position than the other, the other side, then again, please go and see the GP. If there are any changes in the skin and the nipple, I've mentioned about flaking and scaling. Some women may mistake scaling and flaking for eczema, particularly if they have a history of eczema. But please, if you're concerned, and you know, even if you do have eczema, to get a simple second opinion, it's always a good idea to see your GP. As I've said, nine out of 10 cases of breast cancer are diagnosed by women themselves. They go to see the doctor. And there is a, um, a little mnemonic called TLC. Th and it means touch, look, and check. Now my time is up for part one of breast cancer, but I'd just like to leave you with that. Breast awareness, women, is your responsibility. So if you notice any changes, go and see your GP. You've been watching Health and Focus with Dr. Laura. I've been talking about breast cancer part one, and we'll see you back for part two surely. Prosper and be in health. God bless you. Bye-bye.